Yes. Welcome to the EPIC 2022 conference. Delighted to be uh, joining with all of you today. And um, my name is Don Jeswishan, and I am the challenge area lead for healthcare and health service delivery for, uh, for AgeWell. We've got an exciting program lined up for you, and we've got um, four speakers, um, individuals, leading researchers, and stakeholders in the, um, in the field. And um, <clears throat> we'll start with Dr. Ilham Kudabandalu, who was a postdoctoral researcher at Kite Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, University Health uh, Network, followed by um, Emilia Gauthier Beaupierre, and she is a PhD candidate in population health at the University of Ottawa. Sam Newmark is a master's student in the translational research program at the University of Toronto. And he'll be joined by Sandy Stamp, is the chief operations officer of RENA and has worked in developmental disabilities field for over 30 um, years. So I'm delighted to have these individuals uh, join us. Uh, I'd just like to review some of the format for the, uh, for the afternoon. Um, first of all, those of you that have been following the Age Well activities, you know that the EPIC conference will run for 10 days. Uh, yesterday was the first one, and it runs right through until June the uh, 10th. The challenge area presentations will take place on Crowdcast, as this one, from 1 till 2.30 Eastern Time on Monday to Thursday, this and um, next week. On Friday, June the 3rd, join us for Making Connections, an epic networking event with Jennifer Polk from PhD to Life, followed by an APPTA-hosted workshop, Bridging the Gap, Engaging in the Policy Space as a Health Researcher. Moreover, AgeWell partners are hosting four French and language sessions on June 1st for a tour of three IT lab focusing on assistive and training technologies. I encourage you to check out the AgeWell EPIC conference webpage for additional details and registration information. Today's session will be comprised of three oral presentations following each presenter and an overall discussion with general Q&A that places the presentations in a larger discourse and addresses potential impact. And this being the healthcare health services delivery um, theme, we'll be looking for uh, the uh, large, large issue um, questions to be coming forward. All attendees, please um, use the ask a question box to ask questions. I will be monitoring of that and leave a comment on a question and upvote questions that others have submitted. The session is being recorded and will be available for playback. And those links to the playback will be on Crowdcast and on the conference uh, site. So if you're wishing to, um, wishing to follow up, on the uh, uh, program with other, other colleagues in your organization, um, please uh, please do pass on that, uh, that information. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ilham Koda Bandalu, and she specializes in behavior and movement analysis of people <clears throat> in smart homes. And her focus is on using machine learning methods for anomaly detection in smart homes. She received her PhD degrees in geospatial information systems in 2022, 21, I'm sorry. Her research interests include spatial temporal modeling, machine learning, activity recognition, and movement analysis. Currently, she is working with Dr. Andrea Lamoni and Dr. Shiraz Khan in Intelligent Assistive Technology and Systems Laboratory on the project of real-time location tracking systems in long-term care. Can I turn it over to you, Ilam? Thank you very much. Thank you. One 
Does your microphone talk? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to speak about So, Elham, you're having some microphone issues. Uh, we're getting a lot of feedback. Um, do you have um, headphones that you can plug in there? Can you speak? Let's hear if there's uh, some feedback. Is it fine? Uh, we're still getting feedback. I'm just going to mute you for a moment there. Uh, can I stop? There's still some really bad feedback. Yeah, um, but how can you solve it? Do you have headphones? I, I thought you had, headphones. yeah, you had some headphones right. in before. We'll just pause briefly, Don, sorry, um, as we wait for no worries. Yeah. Okay, let us know when you're ready to test. Are you ready, Alham? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a bit better. Still some feedback, though. I would also turn down uh, your your mic. Or mute okay. any other devices you might have. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, I think it should be fine right now. That is great. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to speak about our project uh, in Essex, uh, which is assessment of social engagement uh, of people with dementia living in long-term care by collecting the uh, location data with the real-time uh, location system. Atlas technology and describing uh, the social behavior by extracting the location data features from RTLS data. Uh, social engagement uh, refer uh, to quality and degree of one's involvement uh, in uh, social activity and interaction uh, with others. Uh, in people with dementia, uh, social e engagement is uh, positively uh, associated uh, with the quality of life, uh, physical and mental health, and uh, quality of care. Uh, social engagement is, uh, uh, of uh, residents is influenced by a number of uh, individuals and uh, factors, including uh, the personality, cognitive, and uh, physical ability and uh, mental health, and it reflects on uh, uh, an individual's uh, interest, ability, and opportunity for involvement in uh, social activity. Uh, why a study of a social behavior or a pattern of a people with dementia is important? Uh, it is important uh, because uh, to help the uh, to identify uh, those people who need uh, more support uh, with uh, social engagement, but uh, how we can measure the quality of one's involvement in uh, social activity. Uh, for uh, real-time tracking of a residence, uh, we use uh, RTLS uh, technology. Uh, this system uh, is a relatively simple and inexpensive uh, technology with many healthcare applications and uh, is already widely used uh, within age residential care settings. RTLS uh, collect detailed information about individuals' movement in space and time and proximity to others and can provide valuable information about uh, where residents spend their time and with whom. Uh, in this figure, you see a part of a studio site, and these dots show the uh, location of a residence in different time of day uh, in these sites. Uh, the objective of uh, this study is developing an index of a social engagement based on RTLS location data by first identifying features of a location data that reflect aspects of a social engagement over time, and second, validating uh, those features against uh, a clinical measure of social engagement. 
Uh, the site location uh, for this study is Toronto Rehabilitation Institute on the Specialized uh, Dementia Unit. All individuals uh, that admitted uh, to this uh, project are eligible uh, for this study and have cognitive impairment or dementia. Uh, the average age is 80 and they stay uh, in this uh, site approximately for two months. Uh, and so far, the data of 17 individuals were collected and uh, the study is uh, recruiting at this time. And uh, regarding the data, uh, for collecting data, we use ultra-wide uh, band beacons uh, mount on walls and uh, a small restaurant sensor. Uh, index of uh, social engagement uh, is uh, gathered weekly and social engagement with all uh, items uh, is uh, recorded uh, shift by shift uh, by a trained clinical uh, research assistant at the study site. Uh, based uh, on our TLSI data, we defined uh, four groups of uh, behaviors at uh, dual times, proximity to others, activity level, approach, arrogance, and popularity. Uh, before going in detail of uh, these features, I wanted to explain how we define uh, social context. Uh, if you look at this map, uh, you can see some uh, lines uh, that uh, show uh, this uh, uh, this person are in the same area uh, in the same time. In fact, uh, we define uh, uh, social context uh, uh, based on uh, when uh, two people are in the same room within two point uh, meter of another residence. And uh, the number of this uh, line show how many times that uh, they are, uh, they have contact uh, with others. Uh, and uh, the first group of our features is uh, dual times, uh, which include the measure of uh, time in different areas including uh, in private rooms, another residence room, hallways, and share uh, social areas. Uh, these features, these uh, features are shown in this uh, chart, uh, and uh, you can uh, see the result of different uh, residences uh, for seven days. Uh, as uh, you can uh, see, uh, the pattern of spending uh, time by different people are completely different from another one. Some of them always tend to spend time a lot of, uh, uh, in share area, while some uh, residents always spend a relatively limited time uh, in the share area. Uh, it is a kind of a similar over time. Resident number one with orange color spend uh, similar time in different days uh, and his pattern is completely different uh, from another residence, uh, for example, number two. The second group of our features uh, focus on features related to proximity to others, uh, which include the uh, duration and distance of our contact uh, with others. Um, we extract uh, the total time a residence spent uh, with other residents during a shift. For example, uh, in this chart, uh, you can uh, see uh, the different uh, results uh, of uh, a person uh, spent with uh, another residence uh, for different uh, days, for nine, sorry, uh, for nine days, and uh, it is uh, just uh, the result of uh, one person for in different days. The bottom of the line shows different time of day from 8 a.m. Uh, to 7 p.m. The black bolt lines show uh, uh, the average time, as uh, you can see, and each line sh is uh, the result of uh, each day. Uh, and you can see, as you can see, uh, this person spends uh, less time in the morning respect to evening uh, with other uh, people. Uh, another feature is uh, how long uh, contact uh, is uh, last in. Uh, less than five minutes, between five to 10 minutes, or more than uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, another feature is uh, the total time in a contact uh, with uh, one co-residence with two, three, four, or more than four uh, residents. The third uh, group of our features uh, are uh, our examine activity level uh, that uh, make a uh, user of a special temporal aspect of data, including a speed of uh, movement, uh, walking time, and uh, distance um, uh, 
and change in speed. Uh, this group of uh, features uh, show the ability of a person in movement. Uh, for example, uh, this picture uh, show a uh, walk path of a person uh, in different uh, colors, uh, in different speed uh, in the hallways. Uh, and the last group of our features uh, focused on uh, features related to behavior of a residents. Uh, we are still working on this one, uh, but uh, we are interested to this idea how people behave uh, when they see another residence. Uh, they approach to them or actively avoid them. And uh, we can uh, to do this uh, by the way they um, react uh, when they see another residence. Uh, they change their speed, direction, or ignore this person. And I started uh, to developing a popularity index, uh, which is uh, how much other people approach or spend uh, time uh, with this person. Uh, the result. Uh, the result uh, showed that uh, with an individual, uh, the pattern of uh, social behavior were fairly consistent all the time. In fact, in terms of a uh, pattern of uh, distance uh, to other, uh, the number of uh, contacts uh, and the total time that a person uh, spent in different areas, uh, we can see consistency over time. However, between individual in the social behavior, uh, there was a substantial of variability. As a next step, uh, these features uh, will be used in machine learning models uh, to predict uh, clinical social engagement scores, uh, rates uh, twice daily and uh, weekly social engagement uh, index uh, scores. Our goal is to identify pattern uh, in the features uh, that are correlated uh, with the relevant clinical measure and then uh, to accurately predict the intensity of a behavior consistent uh, with the clinical measures. And uh, at the end, I would uh, like uh, to thank the STIX team uh, for their continuous support and valuable inputs. And thank you for uh, pay, uh, paying attention. And if uh, someone has a question, I will be happy to answer. Well, that's <clears throat> fabulous. Thank you very much. What an exciting application um, for technology. Um, so here's one question uh, for you. Elham, how do you think social behavior has changed with the pandemic? Are there clinical policies that have influenced this? Uh, of course, of course. Uh, in fact, the uh, pandemic showed the importance of studying of a social engagement because uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the social engagement in people are uh, completely decreased and uh, we can see even with uh, uh, people uh, without dementia, uh, social engagement completely uh, changed. But uh, uh, we can uh, see it uh, uh, in a very, uh, 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 in fact, uh, the effect of a pandemic uh, is a very bit more than uh, other people in, uh, uh, in people with dementia. Great. Thank you for that, um, for that question. Uh, Carolyn asks, has there been any data collected on virtual connections when in-person social connections are not possible due to lockdowns or infections in a community? Uh, just a uh, <clears throat> in other words, the connections that you are tracking are ones that are done physically amongst individuals. And uh, the Carolyn is asking whether there's any kind of tabulation of data on interactions which may take between between an individual and another individual through the internet or through a web-based um, connection. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, uh, the answer of this the uh, first uh, question. Uh, this. Uh, uh, Array of uh, gathering data is a uh, very simple and inexpensive, and uh, uh, it is uh, not uh, don't need uh, to installation. Uh, a person just uh, worn a small rest uh, bag, and uh, this uh, uh, can gather the data of a person. 
so uh, during the lockdown, uh, also people can use this technology. Uh, can I? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I think you're probably answering one of the questions in the chat box. Yes, um, I so I think I think we'll come back to you, Ilham. Um, we'll go on to presentation number two now. Okay. And um, and so just uh, stay with us, and I'll introduce the um, uh, our next uh, our next uh, speaker. So Emilia uh, Gauthier Beaupre um, is a PhD candidate in population health at the University of Ottawa, as I mentioned earlier. She's supervised by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Jutai, and her work revolves around policymaking for older adults, self-management of disabilities, using information and communication technologies. In her other activities, Amelia works on advancing research and policies for older adults by volunteering on age-friendly community projects at the municipal level, supporting healthy aging at the federal level, and contributing on research projects focused on cognitive impairment and Parkinson's disease. Overall, Amelia's activities all around revolve around one main goal, promoting healthy aging through innovation for older adults. Can I turn it over to you, Amelia? Introduction done. I'll just share my screen. Okay, here we go. So, um, hello everyone and welcome to my presentation entitled uh, Policies to Support Older Adults Health Self-Management Using Information and Communication Technologies. So, this presentation is going to present part of my PhD project. And um, as a little bit of background, uh, we know that more and more technologies are being developed um, and more research is being done on these technologies. But uh, policies that are supporting their use uh, do not always advance in tandem, unfortunately. So this project looks at the policies in the context of Ontario specifically. Um, so the question guiding my project, the, the larger project, is what factors influence the development and implementation of a framework for policy making for older adult self-management of disabilities using ICTs? Um, and to answer this question, I divided my project into three distinct steps. So the first step is looking at how policies on self-management evolved in Ontario over time. So in this case, it wasn't specific to self-management using technology, but just self-management of health, uh, just to get a better understanding of what's been done in the past on this issue uh, from a systemic point of view. In step two, I wanted to go beyond the history of policies on self-management and then grasp, uh, grasp current policy work in Ontario with a specific focus on self-management using technologies. So uh, to do that, I've invited policymakers in Ontario um, to speak about the programs or policies that they're working on. <coughs> Sorry. And I'll speak to the results of those interviews a little bit later. Um, in terms of the next steps, I'll talk about that at the end as well. So if I talk a, a little bit about step one, sorry, I'm just going to take a bit of water. So if I go back to step one, uh, which was to document the evolution of policies on self-management in Ontario, there were a total of 70, 73 uh, distinct documents with the mention of health self-management uh, that were retrieved. <coughs> So I am portraying the results here in a timeline to visually see what's going on and the kinds of things that emerged from those documents. So first, I thought it would be important to see what health topics were being covered in the policy documents. And so the first document was published in 2000. And then the topic of interest for that one was asthma. And then we can see that as time passed, there was a larger focus on uh, chronic diseases and diabetes per particularly. And uh, reasons for this could include uh, increased pressures on healthcare system from increasing burdens of chronic diseases. Um, in the following years, you can also see that there were some focus on other types of uh, diseases, um, but they were more in an ad hoc fashion um, rather than uh, like chronic diseases and diabetes with their huge burden on healthcare system and the health of individuals. Um, 
in Ontario, I just want to note as well that um, in the late, uh, in around 2008, um, the Ontario government released their strategy on diabetes. So this also explains why there's an emergence of uh, policy documents that focus on self-management of diabetes specifically around that, uh, those years. Um, next, we also documented the political influences um, on uh, the policy uh, document release. So we found that the initial document on self-management of health was created and released when the Progressive Conservative Party was in lead. Subsequently, the Liberal Party of Ontario came in lead and it was noted that healthcare budgets uh, under their lead shifted from focusing on increased investments in healthcare to um, focusing on, um, on uh, family health teams and investments in medical technologies and home care. Um, they were in lead for when most of the documents were released, except the last few documents, which were uh, released under the lead of the Progressive Conservative Party once more. Um, in terms of the uh, technologies and their integration within self-management of health policies throughout time, um, we noted that um, there was this shift, uh, a shift, a healthcare transformation, if I can say it like that, that occurred where uh, self-management became more holistic and when technology started to become included in the policies. And this was mostly, uh, well, that started around the year 2005 um, and technologies were promoted in various documents as effective tools to support some components of self-management, such as being connected with professionals via consultations, but mostly um, its benefits for more effective healthcare system management. So at that time, technologies were not so much um, about what individual people could do with them and how they could um, advance or, or take care of themselves using technology. It was more about how do we make the healthcare system more effective and efficient in, ter in terms of more organizational um, health. So that brings me to step two. Um, so we've established a baseline of what happened over time. And now we wanted to go further in assessing the current state of policies um, specific on self-management and technology this time. Um, and several factors help to explain why there's a need to understand this kind, these kinds of policies in Ontario. So think about the impacts of COVID-19 on caring for chronic conditions and where there's a shift towards more virtual caring models. Uh, think about the digitalization and modernization of care. Think about increased efforts and initiatives that involve health technologies. So here are a couple um, examples from the Ontario government. Um, I don't know if some of you have seen, but the Ontario Ministry of Health recently launched a new tool to connect people to nurses from anywhere, anytime. Um, in terms of technology specifically, the Ontario government is investing in connecting every region in Ontario to internet. Um, and finally, COVID-19 has been a trigger for the development and implementation of several digital tools for health-related needs. So, um, so now what did we do to get information on what's currently being done in Ontario, specifically on self-management and technology? Um, so this is what I'm gonna present, uh, the, the, the preliminary results of step two. Um, so we collected data through semi-structured interviews with policymakers in the Ontario provincial government. And to be involved in this study, potential participants had to be employed under the Ontario government, have occupied their current position for at least one year, have experience working on files that involve older adults and technology or disability and technology. And so the reason that we didn't only limit to only adults is because um, many policies and programs could have been for people with disabilities, not necessarily specific to older adults, but be inclusive of them. So that's why we didn't wanna limit um, this to simply just older adults. Um, so we collected data between October 1st, 2021 and January 31st, 2022. All of the semi-structured interviews had to be conducted virtually, of course, considering the public health restrictions in place. 
And um, after sending out 61 invitation emails, we were able to recruit 10 eligible participants from four different ministries, which was a great surprise for us. So these were the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Seniors and Accessibility, the Ministry for, of Children, Community and Social Services, and the Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. So this just shows that um, those individuals, those policymakers in those four different ministries are doing work to advance self management, health self-management of older adults through the use of technologies, whether this is directly or indirectly, I'll go through that in my next slides. So to analyze the results, we used um, the health policy triangle framework, which emphasizes that to evaluate policies, we need to look at multiple components. Um, and these components are actors, actors involved in, in the policy making, the content uh, of the policy, the process by which the policies are developed, and the context in which all of this occurs. So let's start with actors. Um, we've identified that much of the policies um, are derived from a series of interactions among various stakeholders. And these may be individuals from the same ministry across other departments or agencies, uh, from different jurisdictions, from external organizations, or people with lived experience. Um, engagement with these different groups were uh, mostly the result of either planned or scheduled engagement. Um, this could take the form, for example, of recurring meetings, such as federal, provincial, and territorial tables, FPT tables. Um, some were more ad hoc and occurred when there was a need or um, um, when there was a need to collaborate, or they were through advocacy activities uh, conducted by external organizations or partners. Second, um, we have content. So the content of the policies uh, on self-management and technology had various populations of interest. So the policies mainly focused, oops, sorry. The uh, policies mainly focused on uh, populations of older adults, people with disabilities, people with specific diseases, or in a particular case, businesses. Um, and these types of support that were offered by the different policies were either direct support uh, through a specific program or service delivered to people who are self-managing using technology, or they were indirect in the sense that some funding may have been provided to external organizations to deliver a program that would tackle self-management using technology. Um, others were just a piece of legislation or regulation that uh, policymakers were overseeing, and they con and it concerned self-management of technology uh, using technology to a certain extent. And in other instances, um, this uh, self-management of te uh, using technology was a component of a strategy, a strategy or action plans. Uh, let's move on to the next section. So in terms of process specific characteristics, so how were these policies developed um, and, and what did they look like? Um, so they were either um, funding uh, mechanisms, uh, so providing funding to organizations to do different kinds of work in that area. They were either program or service delivery um, activities where you had a specific program that funds or um, a specific program that helps older adults buy technologies uh, to, to self-manage uh, or, or, or be participants in their care, or they were contracts that were delivered to external bodies. Um, the way that in which the policies were developed usually followed a top-down approach or a hybrid approach where a top-down and bottom-up um, are, are um, intertwined. So mostly the ideas, um, it seemed like the ideas were coming from ministers or, or senior management, but uh, in the hybrid, more hybrid policy making in that area, um, there was a lot of um, push from advocacy groups or um, through consultations with, with um, people in, on the ground, while you could get that bottom up advice and, um, and, and that would help shape the policy. And then, oh, let's just talk about evaluation first. So in terms of evaluation, um, the, the, the evaluation of these policies was either scheduled or ad hoc. Uh, when it was scheduled, it was usually between the first, second, or third year of the program. Um, and then when the policies were um, evaluated, they used performance measurements via indicators, so to assess the outcomes um, of the program.
And then finally, uh, to get a, a full picture of, of these policies on self-management and technology, um, we also found that, or, or the participants told us that a context had a really big impact on how these policies were shaped. Um, so if we think about uh, the first, first driver, contextual driver, of course, we have emergencies. Think about COVID-19. Um, the participants mentioned that COVID-19 was a driver for a lot of the virtual and digital um, policies that were put in place and are currently still happening right now. Um, so this, this emergency led to fast change in the policy. Next, we also have the provincial political agenda. Of course, this is, a, uh, this is why and how um, uh, public servants do their work. They follow the political agenda that is um, put forward. Um, and one good example of this, which, which I think was really interesting from the interview, is about economic development and how um, one of the ministries had the role to support Ontario-based businesses in their early stages of like startup or business planning. And the, these businesses sometimes included health technology. Um, and so, see, there's an indirect link to how um, the Ontario government was supporting self-management via technologies, but it was indirect in that it was supporting businesses in their business planning. We also have con constitutional drivers, and this, um, by this I'm talking about the federal relationship or provincial relationship that Ontario has with other jurisdictions. Um, so, of course, a uh, federal relationship, when there's fundings with strings attached, well, that drives the policy that's being done, of course. Um, and then discussions during FPT tables, um, so um, exchanges of ideas between the federal, the provincial, and other provincial uh, governments also drove some of the orientations of the policies that are developed. And then finally, in terms of contextual drivers, um, any opportunities for knowledge exchange, whether this be through conference attendance or engagement with key stakeholders in the field, was all said to shape and have an influence on the policies. And then before I move on to my final slide, um, I just wanted to note that a critical component to remember um, in these preliminary, pre preliminary findings is that significant work is being done in Ontario uh, in regards to health self-management using technology, and it comes from various domains. So like I said, even from the business side of things. Um, the policies itself are influenced by a lot of actors. They're influenced by the process by which they're developed um, and also the context in which um, they're developed. So one final thought um, or, or preliminary finding from um, this step two is I asked questions about innovation and what they see as being innovate, how, how they view innovation um, as a whole in policy making in that area. So the main overarching definition of innovation that was shared by participants is that innovation occurs when you increase the value of current models, whether this be by creating something new or improving something that already exists. One participant also mentioned that innovation should allow for the solution to be better for more people and that this is this was shared from an equity and accessibility standpoint. So it's not just about being innovative because innovative is a buzzword, uh, but it was more about improving something for the better uh, good. In terms of how should innovations be developed in policies, uh, participants responded that it should come from a bottom up generation of ideas. It should allow for unfiltered and honest exchanges of ideas and from, from a constant monitoring for new and emerging solutions. So public servants should be on, on the lookout for new um, and, and different ways of doing things. In terms of how to implement innovations in government, participant, participants showed um, shared how the use of pilot testing was a common and good avenue with little risk for people involved and, and financially as well. However, it was noted that uh, sufficient funding should be kept uh, to allow for implementation of new ideas, which was not always the case due to budget constraints. So um, in terms of next steps, very quickly, uh, steps one and two is what I presented to you today. Um, with the results of step two, I hope to develop a framework for policymaking to allow for uh, policies. To, so so, so the, the ultimate goal is to um, allow the public servants and the policymakers to have a, a, a good framing 
to then develop policies that will take in cons into consideration all these newer technologies that are coming out and that could support self-management. So be be more on um, uh, looking out for new things that are coming out and, and how to include them in policies that are um, current or new policies coming up. And all uh, after the framework is developed, I hope to validate it by sending a survey to key informants. I'll analyze that and then adjust the framework as needed. So that's um, everything for me today. And you have my email address there if you have uh, questions beyond the, beyond the presentation today. Thank you. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you very, uh, <clears throat> very much, Amelia. We've got a couple of questions um, here for you. Um, yes. So let me just take one of them um, and then we'll deal with the other ones uh, towards the end after our third presentation. Can you speak a little bit more, and this is from Mark, can you speak more about how we can improve the lag time between tech developments and actual policy that hits the road in practice? Uh, why the lag? And I know this is expecting you to be somewhat prescient there, uh, but do you want to take a stab at that? Sure, I can try. So actually, that's that's the why of my project. That's <laughs> un trying to understand why these newer technologies are not making it out there or into the policies as fast as we, as we would hope them to 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 make it. So um, I don't think I'd have a very detailed explanation for it. But as we're seeing, there's a lot of these contextual factors that are driving the policy. So I think an avenue to address that would be to go through one of these contextual factors. So um, I've been told in my interviews that advocacy works. Um, policymakers are listening to experts in that area. So one avenue is really to push and to use those rather than going directly to government, go to those external partners that have uh, uh, like a lot of weight and, and that governments are listening to and then advocate for that, make them advocate for these newer technologies that need to be implemented um, and integrated in the policies. So I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, uh, Emily. Sounds like maybe the volume and frequency of advocacy really does make a, may make a difference. It so does. Let's now turn to our third um, group of speakers. So Sam Newmark is a master's student in translational research program at the University of Toronto. He is a recipient of an AgeWell graduate award and is also a member of the HQP advisory committee as an Ontario regional representative. Throughout the pandemic, Sam worked as a support worker providing care for older adults with disabilities. Sam's research focuses on evidence synthesis and applying scientific knowledge to improve health and patient care. One of his research areas, which he will discuss today, is improving access to health services for aging adults with developmental disabilities. And joining Sam is Sandy, representative of the stakeholder uh, side. Glad to have her. She is a chief operations officer of RENA and has worked in the developmental disabilities field for over 30 years. Sandy is passionate about advocating for the developmental disability population and has led Rena through unprecedented growth. Leveraging her nursing background, Sandy is an expert in the intersection between health and developmental services, especially in how it pertains to aging. She is a key player in establishing the Ontario Partnership on Aging and Developmental Disabilities in 1999. Sandy continues to lead the OPADD's activities and provides extensive guidance and innovation on aging and developmental disabilities. I'll turn it over to you, Sam and Sandy. Excellent, can you see my slides all right? We can. Awesome, okay, so good afternoon and on this hot day in Toronto and I'm pleased to share with you all one of my projects for my master's program at the University of Toronto, investigating the challenges of accessing senior healthcare services for aging adults with developmental disabilities in Ontario. And Sandy, who is our patient, uh, our partner on this project, uh, will begin with providing some background on uh, this topic and her organization. That's great. Well, thanks so much. And certainly it's my pleasure to uh, present here uh, with Sam today. 
Uh, just to give a little bit of context, so uh, people with developmental disabilities have a lifelong need for support. Uh, they, they really need this to live a healthy, safe, and fulfilling life. Good news is that people with developmental disabilities are living into older ages for the first time in history, which is amazing. However, it also brings some challenges about access to senior services. RENA is a nonprofit social service agency, and we support about 350 people with developmental disabilities in a range and a variety of residential uh, settings. But we also support lots of uh, people who are living at home with their families through uh, recreation, respite, outreach, employment, and other types of programs. So Rena has really been working hard on the challenge of access to senior services for people with aging and developmental disabilities for, for many years uh, through advocacy, but also making connections to those who can really help us work through complex issues. This was really the impetus for us to reach out to the Translational Research Program, and uh, we were very lucky to find Sam and his group. Back over to you. Great. So um, the, really the goal of our project was to explore these challenges of accessing healthcare services in order to inform future research and even innovations in this domain. And by healthcare services, I mean publicly funded services by the Ministry of Health, like rehabilitation or day programs for seniors that are simple to access for the average senior, but not those living with developmental disabilities even though they may equally qualify. And we use this guide called the Toronto Translational Framework, which is a patient-centered method of addressing complex challenges. And you can scan the QR code on the top right to learn more if you'd like. I, and I know this is a busy diagram, but I want you to focus on the big picture and where we use it to go from the current state on, of issues on the left to the desired state on the right. And this project really focused on the left side in understanding the current state by discovering uh, the needs and defining the healthcare problems and framing it in its appropriate context. And the reason you might see arrows everywhere is because this process is not linear. And along the way, we are constantly validating and verifying with people like our partners and our stakeholders like Rena to ensure that we are on the right track with our research and then jumping back and forth between different stages. So you might be wondering exactly how we did this. Well, we started with reviewing some published literature, but of course the evidence was slim, especially for this unique population that is new. However, this population is not new for the people that are working with them every day. So we reached out to speak to people through our professional networks and through people that spoke at different conferences. The goal of these conversations was to one, verify the population need, two, identify these knowledge gaps, and three, contextualize these problems. Because reading about these issues is one thing online, but hearing the stories about reality provided a significantly better context for our team to problem solve. And in the diagram on the right, you can see all the job titles of people we spoke to, starting with individuals with developmental disabilities. At the middle, we wanted to connect with our patient population to try and understand you know, what is their perspective and then their care providers and managers in the developmental services. While at the same time, we spoke to healthcare professionals to gain their perspective on the issue and also people at day programs you know, providing these services to understand their nuanced details uh, that may not be available to the general public. And our group prepared uh, a little summary video, which I'd love to share with you all right now. Today, we will be speaking about aging adults with developmental disabilities, or for short, DED. These disabilities refer to a group of conditions that may impair someone physically, cognitively, or behaviorally. The most common types of DED are Down syndrome, autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, or others. People with DED are just like everyone else. Like you and me, they have hobbies and passions like painting or reading or playing sports. So why is this important? Well, people with DED are seen as different. So they may not get their needs met or are often left behind in the healthcare system. Also, with recent advancements in healthcare and community support services, 
more people with DD are living longer into old age. This brings upon new problems we have never faced before. This leads to our needs. Aging adults with DD need access to health-related services. These services can include senior day programs, rehab support, as well as dementia support. So why is this important? Well, we believe that everyone deserves equitable access to health-related services. Meet our patient representative, John. John is trying to access senior day programs. He does not want to go to day programs funded by the MCSS as these programs are no longer the right fit for him with his aging needs. He's trying to access other services available to the general public through the Ministry of Health, which are much more suitable for him and his aging needs. After some investigation, we discovered a few reasons that might be preventing him from accessing services. John faces challenges accessing senior day programs and rehab support because he does not meet the eligibility criteria due to his early age and unique characteristics of his DD. John also has been struggling to communicate his needs with his healthcare providers. At the same time, his providers do not communicate effectively in return, making it a bi-directional problem. John also has dementia, but cannot receive a proper diagnosis to qualify for services since the diagnostic tools were not designed for people with DD. Further, due to the lack of education and awareness of DD, John has faced discrimination and stigma with this label. And these labels often produce fear among staff. Even if John accesses health-related services, the staff in healthcare settings have different training than those working in developmental services, which contributes to differences in care. And with limited staff, resources, and wait lists, funding is always an issue. And we need to reconsider the allocation and prioritization of funds. In summary, our roadmap with John highlights the six main problem areas we encountered during our case study. Today we will be... So here we've got, uh, you know, a little summary of everything that we spoke about in this video. And, uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, and uh, I can assure you that we've got many more specific examples, but this is we're sort of limited what I can cover today. And our next steps um, are to select a specific theme to generate ideas to expand this intervention. Um, this intervention. Uh, but the key to this next steps will be to include the voices and experiences of those living and caring for older adults with developmental disabilities during this co-creation process. And it's easy for me as a researcher to stay in my office and hypothesize about what will work, but the best thing is to bring these individuals to the table and collaborate together. And there's some key takeaways that I'd like to leave with you all today. First, there is a clear need to improve access to healthcare services for aging adults with developmental disabilities. And this is not just in Ontario, but this is a problem all across Canada. And I encourage everyone in the audience today to think about how you might be able to facilitate more inclusion in your organization or your health services. And second is the importance of engaging stakeholders and industry partners early in study design. Our team looked at published literature, but it doesn't come close to speaking to people in the field directly to learn if your research project will you know, generate an actual positive impact or change in your community. And then if not, then you're allowed to adapt and iterate early in order to save time and effort. And last, I'd like to give a big thank you to my team at the Translational Research Program, pictured here on the right, uh, our instructor, Dr. Richard Fodi, for guiding us throughout this project, to our partners at RENA and Sandy Stem for joining us today to present this project, and lastly, to Agewell uh, for giving me the opportunity to share this project and for supporting me as a trainee throughout my academic studies. So thank you, and I guess we'll have some time for some questions. Thank you very much for that, Sam and, and Sandy. Um, extremely uh, important and a powerful set of messages coming out of this. Let's start with one question. and. Um, the uh, question Ty is interested in or curious 
how willing were people to speak about this issue when reaching out to different stakeholders? Well, you know, it's interesting. Anyone that's sort of working in this field is really passionate. And, you know, from an advocacy lens, is really passionate about their individuals that they work with. Uh, and it's, you know, quite emotional, actually, for some of the support workers that are trying to get individuals into programs. You know, there was one story at RENA, uh, an individual had to wait six months to get uh, into sort of these adult day programs uh, because they were so resistant to bring them in. But then at the end, once the individual was part of this program, uh, they were an excellent fit and they were you know, very loved by all the peers and, and everyone. So there is this stigma and there are these barriers of eligibility, but the people in the industry want to help. Do you want to add anything to that, Sandy? Yes, I was going to say, I don't think that the problem wouldn't be so much about uh, would people be willing to uh, start talking? It's trying to get them to stop. <laughs> so, yes, I think our sector are uh, we're used to being very, very strong advocates. And I always uh, look at this issue as sort of an, an interesting one about, you know, we had to really fight for inclusion for children in schools and we had to fight for inclusion in employment. We're continually fighting for inclusion in housing. And I call this inclusion comes of age. So people um, are now seniors and we, we now need to look at what does inclusion mean as people get older and are older programs for seniors really adopted? And do we have the information, the knowledge um, and, and the openness uh, to, to, to look at inclusion for people with disabilities as they're getting older? Great. Thank you um, for that. Very encouraging. Um, so let me now take the opportunity to um, have um, the participants join us and we'll work through some of the questions that I, um, I know are on, online and uh, <clears throat> perhaps we'll start um, with Ilham. And uh, thinking uh, about the response that you had given previously, um, Ilham, um, from your presentation, this particular question comes from um, um, from Carolyn, and it is: Has there been any data collected on virtual connections when in-person social connections are not possible due to lockdowns or infections in a community? Uh, is that we can hear you. Uh, yes. I'm reading uh, her question. Uh, has there been? It's the uh, um... it's, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'm not uh, sure about uh, the result uh, about the answer of this uh, question. Uh, Yes. Yeah. I am, yeah, I understand because your project was very much focused on the physical interaction, which yes. takes place within the facility, and um, and and uh, amongst the residents and staff, etc. So, it this question would be outside of the scope of your project. Yeah. Okay. But I think the question is an important one because it raises the opportunity perhaps to explore the categorization in your activities section um, an opportunity to capture the linkage and exchange that would take place between a resident and somebody outside of the institution do you think that would be of some value uh, yeah of course uh, it is a uh, very important uh, but uh... Uh, we can uh, gather this information and uh, use this information uh, from people outside of uh, sites. Uh, but uh, here uh, we are just uh, focused on the data of uh, people that uh, in a residential home and gather this information. Right. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Elham. Can I now move over to um, Emilia? Did you notice a difference in the outcomes and policies that were developed from a top-down versus a hybrid? 
Um, so I, I think uh, by asking the question, there, the answer is there. Yes, uh, there was certainly a, a difference. However, I will point out that uh, while some policies seem to come more from a top-down approach, um, they're always developed. Well, it seemed like there was some form of consultation or collaboration that also inform the policy. Um, but mostly, most, most of the policies were from a hybrid approach where, you know, a great idea came from, top, from the top of the chain and then uh, a lot of discussion consultation did happen at the lower end to then shape um, the, the, the aspect of the policy and, and um, the way the policies were implemented. So uh, yes, definitely there are some differences, but I would say most of them took a hybrid approach um, because you know the way government works, you do need some form of top-down approach sometimes as well. You Not everything can always come from the outside, uh, but I think that people who are developing and, and are using more of this top-down approach are coming from somewhere. They are using their personal experiences or experiences of people that they know in um, proposing some forms of policies. So um, food for thought there. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is another question for you, Emily, but I'm going to move on to uh, uh, Sam and, and Sandy uh, for this round. Um, Sandy, specifically, can you speak to the value of working with researchers on projects uh, like this? Yeah, it's incredibly helpful. I think for community agencies like ourselves, we're nonprofit social service. Uh, we find that the diversity of um, uh, people taking a look at a, a, a problem, especially these uh, complex problems. Um, you know, when we first started to discuss it with the students, we said one of the biggest problems that we have speaking about policymakers is <laughs> when we talk to government, we talk to policymakers, and we try to advocate is to try to do so clearly so that people really understand. And, uh, what the issue is, and then also what are some potential solutions. So having other people take a look at the problem helps you to map it and to understand it very clearly. And I think that was one of the huge benefits of this is really to try to have some language in order to talk to other people. We are very passionate, as Sam has said, but sometimes that can be a detriment to trying to get your ideas across clearly. I find that um, the resources like this really help nonprofits and social service agencies immensely. Let, let, let me now turn that question around uh, and ask Sam how he might have benefited and appreciated the opportunity for the interaction um, at the stakeholder community. Yes. So w when as students, you know, it's easy to sort of get lost in you know whatever work that you're doing so having those real world partners and having people that are working on the field can add tremendous value to any research project uh you know sort of that check and balance along the way to ensure that you know the information that we're collecting and the problems that we're solving are actually real and they may actually have an impact very much um thank you for um for that I'd like to just uh, return uh, now to um, to Ilham. When you think of the opportunities that being able to document and track the um, uh, movement and interaction of individuals uh, within the institutional settings to give an, an appreciation of their um, interactions and the quality of those interactions where do you see some of the great opportunities in taking your research to the next step of, um, of, of lessons to be learned to improve the, um, the care delivery? Uh, we are uh, trying uh, to extract features that uh, uh, show the uh, social engagement. By, uh, and after that, uh, we can uh, use this data uh, to predict the behavior of people uh, by their, by their uh, tracking uh, their uh, uh, trajectory in the home or for how much uh, they work, how much they uh, see another people. And uh, so we can understand uh, this person uh, need uh, to more support uh, with social engagement. And we can predict it before it happened. 
and uh, it is uh, very important uh, to understand the behavior of a person in long-term care. Uh, for a short time, maybe a person have a normal behavior, but in a long term, we're tracking a person in a long term, we can understand better his behavior and we can understand he has a problem with social engagement or not. Excellent. Well, uh, it's an extremely, extremely brave initiative uh, that you have undertaken, um, attempting to uh, document and understand that. I can see where there would be incredibly strong opportunities then to begin to come to understand what the quality of those relationships are and what factors would motivate uh, ways to improve those social engagements and interactions. So um, I, I think that's really important work. And those of us that are dealing with the challenges in the healthcare delivery system more broadly um, really will benefit from uh, the foundation that you're setting and the opportunities for um, for further work. Um, let me now ask um, Emilia, um, are, you, are you then comparing the data with qualities to see evidence from B2C versus solely B2B? Does the Canadian health system rely upon qualities as a measurable data metric? And that's from Grayson. Thanks for that question. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand all of the question, but I will answer what I do understand of it. So um, in terms of the evaluations that are done on the policies, um, they spoke more to um, how many more people are being are receiving services. Um, for, so how much more services are being delivered for how many more people. Um, they, they count the number of people that are reached, um, how many people are engaged, um, um, and they do an analysis of impact. And in that analysis of impact, then um, potentially they look at the, the qualities. Um, I'm not sure what B2B or B2C uh, means, but in that case, in the analysis of impact, um, they potentially look at that. However, I don't have those fine details. I'd have to go back in the interviews and look for them. And I'm not sure we did go in that deep into the details because there were so many sections to cover in the interviews. But yes, it sounds like they're more focused on the number uh, of people reached um, at this point. Um, so maybe uh, avenues to improve on or, or suggest in my framework. <laughs> Excellent. And, and Grayson, if you want to uh, tell us what B2C or um, B2B are, um, we'd appreciate it. Uh, because when I read the question, I don't want to pretend that I actually knew what that meant either. So thank you for um, striking out on that, um, on that answer. <clears throat> um, and th this question, uh, and, and it was touched on by Elham's work, but what impact does our new pandemic normal have on your future research plans. Um, LM, do you want to talk about that? Uh, uh, we don't have any pandemic in the future, but uh, now uh, every residence uh, in the uh, site uh, uh, have uh, uh, we are sure they are healthy and they don't have infection. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, uh, like any other research area, uh, if uh, another pandemic happened, maybe it can interrupt it, uh, in, in the research. Uh, we yeah. cannot predict. No, um, I, I, I think you're right, and your answer is, uh, is appropriate. But I think the questioner is really seeing some strong opportunities here. Um, for using this kind of a technology and application into the future. So um, absolutely. So um, I've had a few people uh, chat, uh, uh, Mark, uh, Camelia, Sam, um, B2C is business to consumer and B2B is business uh, to business. So knowing that now, does that change anything that you'd like to, uh, uh, to, to add? Uh, Emily? 
that at this point because I think I would have to look a little deeper into into that. But uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so let me ask a much more general question to um, to all of you. Um, really outstanding, important work that you're doing for us to build a foundation. Uh, and of course, healthcare leaders and policymakers are going to be waiting for these results um, and, and, and ad advancing the, um, the efforts. So to close the sessions, let's go around the group for some final comments and give me your concluding thoughts on what your learnings have been, both from your work and what you heard from your colleagues uh, presenting, or even on a future direction that you'd hope to see the research take in the future. What are those kinds of opportunities that you'd like to like to see explored? Shall we um, start um, with you, uh, Amelia? Sure. Um, so, uh, and a little bit linked to the previous question you asked um, in terms of COVID nineteen, I really see um, the the new normal or, or the pandemic. I think has been ex been extremely valuable in opening our eyes as to what's possible and what's needed uh, out, out there. And, and policies need to follow that. They need to support what's needed and, and the new innovations that are coming out. Um, in terms of my learnings, um, I'm really um, getting a better perspective um, to the kinds of work that are being done by governments. And I think this work is all great, but I think it's still lagging behind uh, all the great things that are being created. And we need, we really need to find solutions to bring those innovations or those new, those new or improved solutions um, out there because I think the system has a huge role to play in promoting or facilitating access and use to of those technologies. So we need to take advantage of that system and, and try to bring the system up to date with what's out there. So I think that'll be what I'll be um, focusing on for the next uh, couple of years uh, or, or at the beginning of my, my career, for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we wish you well with that. Ilham, do you want to share your observations with us? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it is a very important uh, that uh, we can uh, record uh, the trajectory of a person, their behavior, their interaction without interrupting uh, their life and uh, without uh, needing another person living with uh, a resident. Uh, and uh, we can try to uh, anything uh, in his behavior, in uh, physical activity, in mental activity. and. Uh, uh, real time uh, tracking of people is a good opportunity and give us opportunity uh, to understand what happens for a person. Uh, also, uh, in people uh, that uh, live uh, alone, it is uh, more important uh, because this technology is uh, a good opportunity, give us a good opportunity uh, to have uh, many detailed information that uh, we cannot uh, gather in normal life. Great. Well, thank you um, uh, for that. Can I ask you, uh, Sam and Sandy, for uh, for your thoughts and opportunities for future research um, lessons you've taken away? Sure, I'll I'll start. Uh, well, first, I you touched on it a little bit with uh, the pandemic, and you know what is sort of the future hold. And I, I think it's pretty clear that virtual care is here to stay. It's not going anywhere and it will be a part of healthcare and health service delivery uh, for many future years, for probably forever. So it's important for us to really consider how does that really connect and how can we maximize that and balance it between everyone. And we know that, you know, age is very big in technology, but we also at the same time have to understand that for certain populations, there is that sort of digital divide where some populations and even, you know, this bare necessities may not have access to high speed Internet or the right, you know, technologies or tablets in order to access their care provider. If that's, you know, the only method uh, to access healthcare. So these are sort of things that we need, really need to consider, and especially among age well, you know, where there might be those 
massive barriers to access technology and especially for the population of those living with developmental disabilities and their support workers and their caregivers. And the one thing, you know, another takeaway that I learned was how important this sector is when it comes to aging. You know, we like to really pull everyone together, but we have to understand that, you know, individuals with developmental disabilities are an, inter are an integral part of this aging population. And we have to ensure that we don't, you know, leave them behind as we touch forward and accelerate um, in our research and our technology. Sandy, what else would you like to add? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I'd like to take everybody home with me, everyone. So, Ilham, you know, I was interested because I'm like, I want your sensors because, um, <laughs> you know, we design affordable housing. Um, you know, our agency is known for we just finished a build. We're in, engaging on another large build uh, and we design affordable housing for very diverse needs, including people with dementia. And one of our design questions always are how do you best utilize space? Uh, which spaces are really uh, great for that social engagement? engagement, that those are high value spaces. So you sometimes are trying to figure out, is it this space? Is it that space? Like if you design and no one uses that space, what a, like that's a waste of, of our, our, you know, of uh, the thing. So I find that fascinating because my mind went <laughs> immediately as an operational person, okay, like how do we build that? How do we build social engagement and, and create environments that really enable that? And Emily, I was really interested because one of our biggest issues around policy is the in, is is how do you get um, different ministries to talk to each other? Uh, we always talk about siloed systems and things like that, and policy is often developed in a silo. But how do you actually try to look at ways to engage policymakers to co-develop policy? And would love to see that. That's one of our areas of interest is to actually develop a secretariat that is is an in-between piece so that policy doesn't just become segmented um, so that's awesome and then from sam i'm always interested in okay what's next like so we pushed uh, some of these questions forward and it's really about like how can we take a piece and then move it forward to implementation and we're really interested to do that piece so lots lots uh, of very interesting projects really really enjoyed it great well, thank you for your thoughts on that. And to finish it off, um, you've just received a telephone call from the Minister of Health in your in your province. And um, you happen to be in a position where she or he are asking you for their advice as to how to uh, implement and advance what lessons have been learned from your work. How would you, in a two-minute elevator speech, uh, provide them with advice as to how they could advance what you are so passionate and committed to uh, to do? Do you want to start uh, with that, uh, Emil? And I think uh, Sandy raised a pretty good point, and I think I'm going to build on that. Um, I think what the Ministry of Health and all ministries should learn is that other sectors, other ministries and agencies are doing this great work. They need to get the, to get need to get together. They need to talk and find the commonalities between what they're doing and how they can better support the causes that are so dear to them. How do we bring the ministry uh, that works on business side of things with the ministry that's working on older adult side of things? How do we bring them together and bridge that gap? I think they need to talk. I think they need to talk not on ad hoc basis, but on a, a more scheduled manner and then come up with uh, great solutions that way. Great, thank you. Well, I think you've just been put in charge by the minister to set that platform of dialogue uh, up. Uh, do you want to, to comment, Ilham? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, in fact, I think uh, it is uh, very important that uh, we spend uh, time and for uh, getting information about uh, the behavior of uh, older people with dementia because uh, we have also some gap uh, in the uh, information about uh, some behaviors, uh, some uh, and uh, as uh, we are 
uh, want to use machine learning models uh, for predicting their behavior. It is very important to spend more time, more effort uh, for uh, residential like units uh, in different areas, and uh, and we have a uh, strong. Uh, information about different people with different uh, behavior uh, to understand better the behavior of all people uh, because uh, now the number of data sets uh, that we have about uh, behavior of uh, older people uh, with different uh, diseases mental disease is uh, very limited uh, we need to have uh, more information about them uh, to understand and better uh, recognize them uh, by uh, technology method. Great, thank you for that. Sam and Sandy. I wish my elevator speech would be, you know, if you include people with disabilities in your thinking and your design and your planning, you actually enrich and improve that for everyone. Diversity, uh, leads to enrichment and improvement for the whole population. Thank you. Sam, can you top that? Uh, I don't know if I can. I, I agree with many of the statements that uh, have been made today. Uh, one thing I think I would say or ask for implementation is, uh, why don't you work my job for a day? So, you know, I, I was a support worker in the pandemic and, you know, to see what's on the ground is very meaningful and you can really gain a lot uh, from that perspective. There's one story where we had an individual uh, that was working in health services. So, you know, in the nursing and the hospital environment and then came over to developmental services as a support worker. And they were amazed to see the differences in care and the differences that we, the way we interacted with individuals and patients. So even just from an educational or even a training environment, there are inherent differences. And from being able to connect and see what the other people's life and see what the other workers' life is like, uh, I think that way we can, you know, really innovate and make a difference and create some policies that might uh, might help out everyone. Great. Well, thank you to, um, to your response. The Minister of Health in your jurisdiction is very lucky to have all of you working on these, um, these efforts, be that the platform to establish the dialogue amongst the various ministries, or be that the comment of the information and data is really, really important through the importance of inclusion and equity to advance the enriched dialogue amongst the, um, the, uh, the, the actors. So we're coming to the end. I'd like to uh, thank our speakers and uh, to the AgeWell uh, initiative for uh, supporting this kind of important um, research. And um, I'll wish you all uh, a very, um, very pleasant, uh, pleasant evening. And uh, <clears throat> I'll ensure that uh, or encourage you to look at the other programs that are being offered in the EPIC um, conference and um, best wishes with all of your research endeavors in the future. Bye-bye.